So I've mentioned a few times now that this next video is gonna be about my swimming journey, what happened through my journey, the highs, the lot more lows than there were highs, it felt like, and then also what kind of led me to, to leave the sport from my own personal swimming perspective. Even as I film this intro now, I'm still not sure exactly how much I'm gonna share because there's quite a few things that would be, you know, amazing to share, but, you know, certain details I think would be better if they were kept, you know, a little bit more private. So I still don't know how this is gonna go, but yeah, I hope you enjoy my swimming journey. I think the same as anyone who gets into competitive swimming, you know, it was a very natural progression from being in swimming lessons, then progressing through into joining a swimming club. And I joined very early. I think I joined the swimming club at age six. But there was nothing more I loved than being in the water and that feeling of being on your own and with your own thoughts and stuff like that. And I just found it an amazing time to just be on my own and, and have my own thoughts. Although I loved being in the water and, you know, swimming and especially breaststroke. And although I loved being in the water and I loved the feeling of swimming, I did not enjoy training hard at all. I don't know what it was. I just absolutely hate the thought of, you know, training really hard, swimming as fast as I could in training. It just wasn't for me at all. And we were just from a really, really small club. There was only about we 60 swimmers and all the coaches were volunteers. Everyone who helped with the club were volunteers. There was no one who was paid at all. So, you know, it was a really tiny club and, you know, just being just in the pool just was, was pretty easy. Every single time I talked to a swimming club, the guy at the back of the lane and the girl at the back of the lane, who everyone gets annoyed with, who everyone says, I wish I'd get out, I wish I'd go home, why are they even here? That was me. And I can guarantee you there was no one who was who was lazier in a swimming club. I guarantee there's no one in your swimming club who was lazier than I was. Around when I was about 11, there was someone who'd always been a part of the club and always volunteered and coached, but kind of really took the reins and, and kind of really changed the club. You know, we had a massive shake up in, in terms of the attitude and, and the things that were required to be a part of the club. You know, you couldn't just turn up and, well, you could, but um, it wasn't the accepted thing to do was just turn her up and, and doss around. So this was the coach of the club was called Sean Barmer. And, you know, he had a massive change on attitude and, the, you know, the details in training, you know, fly kicks off the wall, breathing on, you know, really simple things. But it was about doing the really simple things really well and then kind of added on and getting better and better from there. And suddenly, you know, there was about 10 people making nationals every year, 10, 15 people. And that's what the crazy thing was, you know, it was a tiny club with, like I said, 50, 60 swimmers top. For 10, 15 of those people to be going nationals, you know, they were winning nationals, people were breaking British records, like every single time they went to nationals. And it was like this whole, the whole club, the feel and what was expected had just completely changed. And although that had changed, you know, a lot of the swimmers' attitudes and what was going on in the club, it didn't change mine at all. I was still the laziest, just, couldn't be bothered to swim at all. I remember I did everything I could. Every time I could get cramp, every time I could miss a session, I'd be doing it. And, you know, I was very aware of what the coaches were saying, you know, how lazy I was sitting at the back of the lane. I'm sure I was annoying a lot of the swimmers being at the back of the lane as well, but just, just really didn't care. And it got to the point where, you know, all my friends were swimming so well, everyone was going to nationals. And as I had mentioned in my last video, you know, I didn't go to school. My friendship group really was at swimming. So, you know, it's not the actual swimming aspect I wanted to, to be a part of. I think it was more of the, my friends are going away and I kind of want to go away with them. I loved the idea of swimming fast. I loved all the details. I loved seeing what was going on. You know, I'd always watch any major championships. I'd be on YouTube all the time watching different races, but I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to do the hard work. I'm going to put up a photo of the results I got when I was 13 at the regional championships. I can't remember where I finished, but it's my 200 breaststroke, which was my main event. But so that was in June of when I was 13 or July when I was 13. And I, you know, I finished near, near the bottom of the field in the 200 breaststroke in our region of England. So this is the kind of level I was at while being a very, very lazy swimmer. I was, I had pretty good technique. You know, that's always was one of my strong points was technique. And then I remember it was in the October and this is the most cliche, cheesy, awful thing that I'll probably ever talk about on this channel. And every time I talk to a club, you know, this is one of the main points to focus on. I call it the moment where I showed that regionals time, that October, I went into training. We trained on Sundays, it was Sunday afternoon. And I just thought to myself, you know, I'm gonna train as hard as I possibly can this session. I'm just gonna see what happens because I've never done it before. So I'm just gonna see how it feels. And I remember, I think it was 10 200s breaststroke of the session. And I remember I was lying on the side after the session. I was only 13 and I was absolutely dying. Like couldn't breathe, could, couldn't walk, you know, I was absolutely dead. And I just thought to myself that, you know, no one in the lane 
has, has pushed as hard as I've pushed there. And then I kind of think, start thinking a little bit bigger. And I thought, well, not only the lane, I didn't see how anyone in, anyone in the whole pool here can have trained harder than I thought. And as the more and more I thought of it, I just thought, I can't see how anyone can have possibly pushed harder than I did that session. And I remember walking out of the training session and thinking, you know, if I've done that today, you know, I'll have a go at it tomorrow. And surely if I keep doing that, if I'm training that hard as, as so I can't breathe, I'm, you know, I can barely get out of the pool, you know, surely that that can, that can help my swimming. And there wasn't anything crazy that I was doing. I was literally whatever the coach asked us to do, I did. You know, in training, I swam as fast as I could pretty much all the time. You know, we had a great group of lads that we just raced most of the time and just did everything that was asked. You know, if our coach said we need to do four 20 minute core stability exercises or sessions a week, I did. I did four, I often did five and everything that was ever asked of, I just did. And my times just literally started, started dropping out of the sky. So in that March after the October, I made my first nationals and you just had to make qualifying time and then you qualified. I'll put the two photos together and you can see the difference, but this is one year. And the only thing that I did in this year was exactly what my coach asked me to do. I went from being fifth in the region of a little bit of England to being fifth in the whole of Britain. And it really was that simple. It was literally, I just did whatever my coach asked me to do. I put in 110% effort. I did, I went above and beyond, you know, to find out more and more things, you know, what, what are the best people in the world doing? How can I, how can I be a little bit more like them? How can I be a better swimmer? And I just was so hungry. I'd gotten really addicted to this feeling of just seeing the times drop and drop and drop. So that was when I was 14 at First Nationals. And over the next two years, you know, my times kept on dropping. You know, there wasn't any crazy 20 second drops like there was there, but my times just kept on coming down really nicely. So I went to Nationals again the year after, I think I was in a, to a double age group and I was in the lower half and I think I came fifth again. So then the year after I won my first ever national medal. So that was when I was 16, I think I came second in the 200 breaststroke. And there was, there was nothing kind of significant that really happened during this phase. You know, I was just kind of getting better. I made a couple of England talent teams and stuff like that, but there was no kind of standout moments in this period of the swimming journey. I think the first standout moment in my journey in terms of a real challenge was the 2015 World Championship trials. So I was only 16 at these trials and it was, also the qualification for the European Junior Championships. And that was something I'd always wanted to go to. And there was a couple of swimmers in my club who'd also been a few years previous. And one of the lads I trained with even won the year before, I think it was. So for me, all I wanted to do was, was go to European Juniors and, and see how well I could do. I can go for two years and this was my first year. So I arrived at the trials and I was in great shape and I went 2.16.0 for the team of breaststroke and heat. And that was a 16 year old British age group record. And I was two seconds under the European qualifying time. And they take the top two. But what you have to do is you have to set the time in the final. So I'd gone back to the hotel, you know, I'd rested. I don't think I'd slept. I think I was just kind of watching TV and I'd gone back for the final and I'd gone pretty much exactly the same time again. So someone I hadn't expected to be faster than me then beat me. So I'd ended up third. So as I mentioned, there was only top two people. So, you know, when I'd broken this British record in the morning, it kind of felt like all my hard work could, could come together. You know, for three years, I've been working as hard as I possibly could every single day. You know, I dropped from a 2.50, three minutes for a 200 breaststroke to be going 2.16. When I was only 16, you know, everything had all come together on this one day. And it had gone from like the best moment of my swimming journey so far in the morning to probably the worst at that point. And, you know, I remember I got back to the hotel and I was just so upset. I was crying my eyes out because, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get picked. Sometimes they take wild cards is what they're called. People who haven't met the qualification standards, you know, I'd finished third instead of second, but they'll take them for experience or because they think that, you know, they might have a really good swim at the European Championships, the European Junior Championships. And I remember I was literally just sitting, waiting, waiting for the email, waiting for the email. And I said to a couple of my friends who had definitely qualified, you know, when you get that email saying you've qualified, let me know. And they all texted me one day saying, you know, I've got the email and I hadn't got the email. And honestly, I was, I was 16 and it absolutely broke my heart. You know, it's all I'd, all I'd wanted, it's all I'd worked for. And it just suddenly felt like everything had been a waste of time. I remember just crying my eyes out because I hadn't got this wild card that I thought I was going to get. Then a few weeks later, I got told I'd been picked for the Youth Commonwealth Games. So that was taking place in Samoa, which if you don't know, is the furthest possible place you can get away from England. It's literally the other side of the planet. So that was kind of a massive pickup. So literally in the space of a couple of weeks or months, I guess, was you know breaking the British record to then getting my heart broken by not making European juniors to then getting selected for Youth Commonwealth Games. So it was really up and down. And that was a massive thing for me. I was so excited to you know make this team and feel like I could go and kind of really put myself on the map, I guess. So between being selected and go to the Youth Commonwealth Games, there was the British Nationals, which we went to every year. And this was one of the best moments of my swimming journey, for sure. I often say to people you know it's not just about you know what time you go what's your best time what medals you win it's not really about that for me it's the experiences what you do with your friends and the places you get to visit and things like that at this British Nationals like I said we're at this tiny club and me and three of the other lads who train together we finished second in the open age group 
four by 100 medley relay. And there was no way we should have probably even made the final of that race, but somehow four young lads from a club with 50, 60 swimmers in who are all good at different strokes, the same age group had, had managed to finish second in Britain. And for me, that was like one of the most amazing things ever because when do you ever get to share that moment, something the club's never done, something that hasn't probably been done in this country for a club so small to win a medal in a relay, you know, at British Nationals, you know, when do you get to share that moment for your friends? And, you know, that's one of the things that will always stay with me forever. And we all split massively faster than our best times were on the respective strokes. So we'd all kind of put it on and delivered for the team. I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually a different day to when I started filming this video. Uh, I've just had a really busy week. I've not really slept. So uh, if you can tell the difference, I don't know if my bag's a little bit bigger or there's a little bit more, it's just not very much hair on my face still, is there? <laughs> but if it looks a little bit different, that's why it's a new week. I went to that competition, we, that was in Samoa. And then we also had a training camp or a, a holding camp as they're called in New Zealand just before we went. And that trip was amazing. Like I said before, you know, it's the furthest place you can possibly get from England. You know, it's a completely different culture to anything I'd seen before in Europe or anything like that. So, so we went there, we spent about a week or 10 days maybe, I think in New Zealand before we flew on to Samoa. And I ended up with bronze in the four by one medley relay a silver in the 100 breaststroke and then a gold in the 200 breaststroke. So I won the 200 breaststroke. So after those performances, you know, I came back home and actually caught dengue fever, which is probably the worst experience of my life. Like, honestly, when I say, I th I'm pretty sure we meant to go in hospital and go to a drip. I was meant to be going to a training camp a couple of days after I got back from Samoa. And I went to the airport I was gonna be leaving from and was so sick. Fortunately, the plane was delayed. And in the 10 minutes the plane was delayed by, I decided not to go to this training camp I was gonna go on because I felt so ill. Asked if I could get my bags off the plane and within 20 seconds of that was thrown up all over the airport. Um, it was the worst experience of my life and it took two hours for um, the person that dropped me off at the airport to turn around and come and collect me again from the airport. So I was in the airport on my own. Any time liquids touched my mouth, I was sick straight away. Any, Honestly, any substance that I tried to eat, drink, and run to the toilet straight away, it's the worst experience of my life without any shadow of a doubt. So I got back from the Youth Commonwealth Games post the dengue fever, and I got put onto the British Swimming World Class Programme, which essentially is where you get paid by British Swimming to swim, and you get targets set every year, and if you meet the targets, generally the amount you get paid goes up. Your targets are based around things like times, you know, processes, actually your skills within the race. And this was massive for me, you know, all I'd ever wanted, as I explained earlier, was to be a professional swimmer. Since I'd had that kind of moment, all I'd wanted to do was be a professional swimmer. And finally I was getting paid to swim and it just felt like, like everything had come together and it was, it was my time. After I'd broken the British record earlier in this year, my coach had said to me and one of the other lads that trained at the club I was at, Luke Greenbank, that we should kind of look to, to where we wanted to go after this club. You know, it was a tiny club and he'd said, if we want to really push on as senior athletes, we'd need to look around for other places to go to. I think when you've got young swimmers, it can be so hard to kind of pass them over to other coaches because, you know, you've, you've helped develop these swimmers, you've seen their full journey. And then to, I guess, recommend to go to a different coach is something quite powerful because you kind of realise that you want the best for the swimmers. There's, there's other things they're going to have to do. So our coach Sean had massively helped in terms of finding other clubs and we tried various places and spoken to quite a few different coaches. We'd also spoken to Mel Marshall, who was Adam Peaty's coach at the time, and he'd just broken his first world record. My coach emailed Mel and said, I've got these two young lads. Luke had broken a world junior record by this point, I think. I'd obviously broken um, the British record. So we were both performing really well and just said, did she think that she would have some space for us to go into her group and she might be able to take us to be senior athletes? So throughout all of this year, myself and Luke had kind of been intermittently training down at Derby, which is where they were at the time. Probably about four hours, four and a half hours to drive down, stay over a couple of nights, then drive home. The first time we actually went to train with Mel and City of Derby, it was in about July, 2015. And she said, oh, at the start of next year for Olympic season, we're going to Australia for seven weeks. Do you fancy coming? And as I'm sure you can imagine, it was a straight yes from both of us. So we went to Australia. I was only 17 at the time, I think, and it was the first time I'd been very independent in terms of, you know, doing my own food shopping and just living away from home. You know, I'd never spent that kind of period of time away from home. So I actually really enjoyed that. And obviously Adam was training with Derby at the time and Mel, and there was also two other lads called Brad and Brad, uh, funnily enough. And, you know, I just kind of created this this really good bond with, with these three lads. And yeah, they're about two or three years older than me. And, you know, we had the same sense of humour and, and we just had such a good time. Like we were having barbecues every week. We were a couple of minutes drive from the beach and it was just the 
most beautiful thing ever. You know, training was going amazing and I created this amazing bond with three lads who are still to this day, you know, my best mates. And I think I'd always struggled because I was at a small club. I'm someone who, you know, I speak my opinions and I'm, I'm quite big on my opinions. And I think it was kind of where I really came out of my shell and became who I am today was, was this trip to Australia. I feel like that trip is what made me who I am today. So once I got back to my own club, Cockermouth, you know, like I said, I felt like I'd really come out of my shell at Derby and especially getting to know these three lads, you know, I felt like I was really becoming who I wanted to be and, and who I was. But then when I came back into that small club environment, you know, there's a couple of issues in terms of I changed character massively and I was a very different person. And I won't go into it, but there was just a few different things that popped up that, that I guess were just products of, of my character changing and coming back somewhere that, that perhaps my character didn't fit into that well is probably the best way of putting it. A couple of months after we got back from Australia was the Olympic trials, which was also the trials for the European juniors, which I was again trying to qualify for, which thankfully this time I did qualify for. So over the next few months before juniors, I carried on doing the same thing. You know, I trained a bit at Derby, a lot of time at Cockermouth still, but was doing the weekends, most weekends down at Derby. Then I got to European juniors, I felt like I finally arrived, you know, training had gone so well and I felt like I was really to take on this championship that I've been waiting so long for. And I did the heats of the 200 breaststroke and I was bang on my PV pretty much. And I got out of the heats and I remember I was walking round to get my clothes and I was like, oh my God, I literally don't know what else I've got to give here. Like that was pretty much everything I've got. I think the bus was delayed going back. You know, usually you'd nap, but then by the time I'd gone to the semi-final, I think I got about 10 or 20 minutes in bed. So I went back for the semi-final and I was in the second semi-final. So I saw semi-final one go and all but two of the swimmers, I think, in semi-final one went quicker than I had in the heat. So I was like, oh my God, if I want to, you know, I've been talking about, you know, trying to win a medal here or potentially win the whole championships. And if I don't go massively quicker than I did in the heats, I'm not even going to make the final. So I did my semi-final. I dropped two and a half seconds off my best time. I went 2.13.0, I'm pretty sure it was. And that put me second into the final the next day. So I woke up the next day and my legs just felt like so sore. I can't even put it into words how horrendous I felt. I had no idea why. And I was the first event, I think, of the whole championship that you could win a medal in because obviously the first night was the semi-finals. And I had a really good group of lads, you know, we had such a good time. We'd been on loads of different camps and stuff like that together. The first event, you're doing it for the lads, let's go and get it. And I, that's all I wanted to do, you know, I, I really believed that I was going to do it. And then the long short of it is I just bottled it. I don't know why my legs felt absolutely drained, but I think it was probably just nerves or whatever it was. I'd really overthought it. I ended up finishing fifth and I went a second and a half slower than I had in the semi-final night before. And I'm pretty sure if I'd done my time from the semi-final again, I'd have finished second in the final. So that was really tough. So while I was at European Juniors, my mum had moved house down from Cockermouth to Loughborough. So when I went back home, instead of going back home to Cockermouth, you know, I'd, I'd finished my time at Cockermouth and I was then training full time with Mel. Nothing else kind of really happened that season. I went to nationals when I was back from European juniors and I think I got a bit of a PB on 100. And I think I'm slightly slower on the 200. But then for the rest of the year, we went on loads of camps. You know, we had an amazing time. Obviously, people were just getting back into training after the Olympic. Adam had had a bit of a break and it just felt like I was so happy. I was finally at the place I wanted to train. And fortunately, I'd stayed on the world-class programme, so I was still getting paid to swim, even though I hadn't met my target the year before. My target had been to get a medal at European juniors. Although, obviously, my best time from the championships would have got me a medal. I hadn't actually won one, so I thought... I may have been off but that year was the best year of, of my swimming career by far I think I visited about six different countries or maybe even more than that for different competitions camps went on three training camps throughout that year and competed abroad I think four times in four different countries so yeah I think seven times been abroad and it was just the most amazing year it was carefree I had nothing to worry about other than swimming and I was just really happy and I think that's the key thing that I always talk to people about when I talk to swimmers or clubs or whatever it is I was just so happy and I think that's the most important thing about the swimming journey like I've said a minute ago it's all about the experiences who you do it with and and do you have a good time on the journey so I got to the world championship trials the next year I was still only 18 and breaststroke in this country was so fast as in the world championship final would have probably been filled with three or four guys all from Britain if you're allowed to take three or four people you're only allowed to take two people and you know the expectation wasn't ever to make the world championship team but it was something that I was really working as if I was as if I was going to and I really believed that I could put a big dent into some of the guys that potentially would have been trying to get onto the world championship team so I went a 2.12.5 in a 200 breaststroke like I said I was only 18 and I think I'm put the graphic up on the screen if I've got it but I think I was the fourth fastest ever behind the 2016 fourth place finisher Andrew Willis Adam and then one of the other juniors who had raced who was a couple of years older than me I also did a PB on 100 as well so although it hadn't been as quick as I'd liked I dropped some time on both events so later that year we raced in Rome which is the most beautiful pool I've ever been 
been to in my life. I swam really slow there and I was kind of completely lost as to why I'd swam so slow. And we came back from Rome and I then spent the next three weeks in bed. I felt so ill, I don't know what it was. It was almost like it was like a cold or flu kind of thing, but it was just absolutely knocked me out. And you know, we were preparing for nationals in a couple of weeks time. And before a big competition, I took about three weeks before it to taper as we call it. So you reduce your intensity and your volume down so that you're not you know, really tired and fatigued. And this ate into that taper phase. I'd lost four kilograms or six kilograms. And I went to nationals, I swam two seconds slower on the 200 and slightly slower on the 100 than when I had in April at the World Championship Trials. The way that swimming works is essentially you target twice a year that you swim really fast, once around April time, then once in summertime. So April times you're kind of qualifying meet and in summertime is your focused summer meet. And British swimming funding is based a lot around that second swim. You always want to be faster in summer than you were at April. And although I'd been slower, you know, I'd spent a huge amount of time out of the water. I was really severely ill and I just kind of felt like I'd actually performed quite well. But then I came back home and I thought about reality a little bit, you know, in terms of I just hadn't swam faster. And there was four lads around my age, including myself, who were all on funding. So there was four of us who were all getting paid by British swimming to swim. And although I'd swam slower, I was still the fastest on the 200 and I hadn't been the slowest on 100, I don't think. But although I knew I had to swim faster in summer than we had in April, I was quite prepared to be taken off the World Class Programme. Although I was very prepared for this, I was very scared about it as well. I was not from a wealthy background. My mum's a single mum, can't work due to my younger brother being disabled. So this funding was really key for me to be able to keep going on training camps, keep going to competitions. So it was something that I was really, really scared about and not because of the fact of being taken off the programme, but the fact of would I actually be able to still swim if I didn't have this kind of financial support. A couple of weeks into the new season, I got an email. Essentially, the email said that I had been taken off funding. And like I said, I was very prepared for this. It still really hurt. I kind of text the other three lads who were on the program as well. I was all really good friends with them all. I kind of just said, I'm gutted, but I hope you lads are okay. And then one by one, they just kind of text me back and said, oh, that's really weird. I'm still on. So out of the four of us, I was the only one that had been taken off. And I had a really hard time understanding this. I'd been slower than the lads on a 200 for a couple of years. You know, I was a couple of years younger than two of them. And I was very much shorter than them and it was the first year that I'd beaten them and it was kind of a bit of why am I suddenly being taken off when I finally got past everyone and I'm really starting to progress and my PBs are dropping massively and I really couldn't understand this and it, it made me really angry you know swimming meant everything to me and like I said I was really worried that would I still be able to swim if I didn't have this funding I just couldn't get into my head as to why I'd been the one that had been singled out when arguably I'd actually had the best season out of all of us so then I asked for the meeting with the guy that kind of makes the decisions around that I can't remember the official title for it but the one in British women who decides which juniors transitioning into seniors are going to be on a world-class program. And we had this discussion, and this is one thing that I'm going to keep private. I'm always gonna be honest with what I share. And there are some things I think are better to be left private. And this is not because I want to keep it private, but I think there are a few factors that could potentially flag up some issues if I actually share the reason as to why I was taking off funding. So essentially there was a reason that the performance people at British women had identified as to why me personally wouldn't be as fast as these other three lads that have been put on program. And I'm going to put up a graphic now, I think, and I'm gonna try and explain it as simply as I can as to why it was so hard for me to understand why I'd been taken off. So I've tried to make this as simple as possible. So as you can see on this chart, we've got a gold, a silver, a bronze, and then for the swimmer that finishes in fourth, I've just left them in white. So as you can see in spring, when we did the 100 breaststroke, I finished second from the time in the finals. For the 200 that we did in the spring, I finished first. For the 100 we did in the summer, I finished fourth. And for the 200 we did in summer, I also finished first. So when this was explained to me, this kind of reasoning for me being cut from funding, um, I was very upset. I was really angry. You know, I said a few choice words as to what I thought about why I'd been cut and why other people stayed on ahead of me. And this really just completely changed my journey. This kind of moment there, you know, I was a kid that loved swimming more than anything else. All I wanted to do was swim. And this decision and the way it made me feel just made me absolutely hate everything about swimming from I didn't want to wake up and go swimming I never wanted to race I just couldn't think of anything worse and this period sustained for months and months I hated it I hated everything about swimming and it had literally been an overnight change I never got beaten again by anyone that was funded ahead of me I wasn't swimming very fast I wasn't beating my PBs but I was still swimming faster than all the lads that had been funded ahead of me on a 200. I remember in April 2018 a lot of my training group were at the Commonwealth Games and I'd raced at a meet in Sweden and it hadn't gone very well I'd said to my coach Mo you know I said I can't do this anymore this is the last thing I ever want to do again is swim I think you know this is this is my time I'm ready to stop and yeah so I was only 19 and I just didn't want to swim 
ever again. I really didn't want to. Mo was at the Commonwealth Games in Australia and Adam hadn't swum as well as he'd wanted to. It was the first time he'd been beaten in years and years in a 50 breaststroke. And we kind of talked about it over text and then agreed we'd meet up and talk about it when she was back from Australia. So Mel got back from Australia and then we started talking about it and I just said exactly how I felt. You know, I never wanted to swim again. The last thing I want to do is get back into competition, back into training. And, and she just said she wouldn't let me stop. And at the time I was a bit like, well, what do you mean? And I'd spoken to Adam as well. You know, we trained together for about three years now at this point, two, three years. And we'd had such a bond through training and we were kind of the only two that really kind of got each other, I think, in the training program, you know, in terms of our opinion on our hard work and, and everything like that. You know, we really connected and obviously we were training for similar events. So we, we trained together pretty much all the time. And Adam wasn't having a great time either, to be honest. And he said the way he was feeling about swimming, he really didn't know if he wanted to carry on training if I wasn't training with him, because like I said, we had we had such a good training bond. So when Mel said that I'm not allowed to stop training, I was just completely like, what What do you mean? I don't get it. I'm, I want to stop. It's all I want to do. And she said I was so emotional about it. I was so upset that, you know, I still felt this way about swimming. I was someone that loved swimming so much and it meant everything to me. But now I've, I've just got hate about swimming. I don't want anything to do with it. And she said I was too upset. I was too emotional. And, and that's not how my swimming journey was meant to end. And I really didn't believe her. I really didn't get it. And I left that conversation kind of saying, oh, yeah, fine, whatever. And then did carry on swimming. And then same again that summer. I didn't swim as fast as I thought I would have. You know, so I'm about the same as I had for the last year and a half or so. And it was a similar kind of feeling. You know, I didn't want to get back in for the new season. But I kind of promised Adam and Mel that I'd do until the 2020 Olympics. It was another two years. I just thought, you know, when do you ever get to go on this journey with your best friend when they're preparing? for well the second olympic games where they're trying to retain their title you know when do you ever get that chance as, as a friend in life and not just as much about my own swimming but also from from an experience perspective and, and just something i wanted to do with my friend and i really felt like i owed mel a lot and i just felt like i should believe in mel and if she thought this was the best option then that's what i should do another new week never change clothes let's move on so for the rest of that season same thing again happened in summer so i'm around the same time as i did in april but then through that summer i actually worked for mel's summer camp and that's kind of where my first ever business grew from. And I'll go into it in a little more detail in my next video. But that kind of just gave me a really different perspective on swimming and kind of really got my love for the sport back. When we came back in the new season, we kind of changed up the way I was training a little bit. Did a lot more volume, so less sprint stuff. And I was averaging, I think, 60, 65,000 meters a week. So this was a very different way I'd been training. I'd been training a little bit more sprint and race pace kind of stuff. But And it's really worked for me. And over the next few months, you know, I started performing much, much better. And my love for the sport through... The his first business that I'd started, which was private coaching, was coming back. And it just felt like everything was starting to fall into place again, which was a really good feeling. And going on to the end of that year, I think this was 2018, we were going to the Short Course Nationals. And I just had this time of 206 in my head for months and months. And that's when I wanted to go at the Short Course Nationals. And I don't know what it was. I was just really, really obsessed with going this 206. And I got to the Short Course Nationals and I did the heats. I think I went 209 and it was really hard. Um, I went out really fast and then just died off a little bit towards the end, but I just had this feeling that in the evening would be a really good swim. And through the time that I've been swimming, when things hadn't been going so well, there'd been a few family members who'd really supported me, whether it was, you know, helping pay for camps or competitions or whatever it was, but there's a few family members who'd really helped. I just texted them between the heats and the finals and said, there's a bird on the window. <laughs> I just texted him between the heats and the finals and said, you know, this swim isn't for me. It's a thank you to you and all the support that you've given me over the last two years or so. And that was just because I just had this feeling that it was going to be the first time I've been proud of myself or proud of any swim that I'd done in going on two years when I'd been working as hard as I could, you know, putting everything into the sport and felt like I'd got nothing back. I felt like it was going to be that night and it just felt like it was going to be a swim I was going to be proud of. So I did this swim and I ended up going 206. I think I went 206.9 and I think that was the fourth fastest English senior ever. So that was something I was really proud of. And it was a really weird feeling. It kind of just felt like everything over the last couple of years had, had kind of just been worth it. And that was, in a sense, the end of my swimming journey. It was a really weird feeling that, you know, it wasn't a time it would ever win a medal at World Championships, but it wasn't so much about the time. It was just about the fact that I knew I'd set that as a target and I knew that I could get to it. And all the targets I'd set myself over the last couple of years, I hadn't been able to make. And for some reason, I just felt like this was something I was going to be able to achieve. You know, it was very emotional. Like it literally been two years of swimming miles away from my best and dropping out was something that meant so so much to me over the next year or so my business really started to grow and there was another one i'd started with adam and things were going so well out of the pool it was a very weird feeling of not so much caring about what was going on in the pool i'd always been so passionate about how i swam and it always meant so much to me 
but it just felt like my passion was moving away from my performance in the pool. It just didn't mean as much to me as it used to mean. Don't get me wrong, there was times I still did swims that weren't quite as good as they should have been. And it, it stung a little bit, but it was not me really caring. And it never really hurt me in the way that it would have. You know, if I used to have a bad swim, it used to really get to me and I used to get really upset about it. But I just wasn't really as bothered as I used to be. And I was having an amazing time. You know, we were going on camps all over the world. We were racing abroad still. But it just, the, the fire wasn't there for, for my own swimming. And it was very much my role was transitioning into, you know, how can I use swimming to promote my business? And how can I use myself being in the pool as a way to get more clients to the coaching or into the camps that myself and Adam were running? And then we raced in Edinburgh in March 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was starting and it looked like we might be going into lockdown. And I did my 200 breast and it was just a really average mid-season swim. I got out and Mel kind of said to me, oh, are you okay? Like she knew that I was always, I was really cared. It really meant a lot to me. And if I had a bad swim, it really did hurt me. I didn't say this, but... <laughs> Um, I just said I don't care at all. You know, I could have been a great swimmer, it could have been an awful swimmer, I just really wouldn't care. And I think at that point, we both kind of knew that that's where my swimming journey was kind of coming to a close. And then I remember the whole country went into lockdown and we, and then we had a couple of days when things started to be canceled. So, you know, Olympic trials was canceled. And then the country started going into lockdown. And I remember I did one gym session at home and I just thought this is not what I want to do at all. I don't want to be in a garage and I don't want to be you know, trying to maintain fitness and trying to get stronger and to get back in the pool. And I remember I called Mel, I just said, I really don't think I want to get back into the pool. I really don't think that that I want to swim again. And she just said that she was so happy I'd made this decision. She said when I'd first wanted to stop in 2018 and I was so upset and angry and she wouldn't let me, she said she knew that's not how my swimming journey was meant to end, but it feels very natural. And rather than being angry about what's happened in swimming, I'm excited about what's to come. I think that was one of the most important things, you know, I wasn't sad about what I was leaving behind. I was so excited about what I was going to get into. We had a couple of really exciting projects I wanted to get started on with the work I was doing with Adam and I just felt like it was the right time and to have Mel say that, you know, the plan had worked. We didn't know what the plan was, but the fact that I'd wanted to stop so badly and then we hadn't and then I kept on going and it just felt like the right time was was quite a good feeling. Anytime I talk to anyone about my swimming journey, you know, there's a few people who were always so massive that were part of my journey and helped me so much. My first ever coach, a lady called Elna. I've known her since the day I was born and, you know, she was such an amazing person to get me into swimming. She was massively supportive all the way through my journey and, you know, she's, she's literally like family. So to have people like her and Sean, who I mentioned earlier, is the coach that kind of took me into a really good junior. I think to have people like that supporting you through your younger stages of swimming is so vital. And I think I was so lucky to have people like Sean and Elna supporting me through that first part of swimming. And then obviously when I moved down to the Midlands, you know, having Mel was, was amazing. The people you train with often turn into family. I think especially as you get older, you know, you see them more and more and that's who you spend your life with. And when I was stopping swimming, I said to Mel, one of the hardest parts would be not being around her and, and her group because, you know, they were like family. And we've been on this amazing journey where we traveling the world, pushing your body as hard as you can go. And I said the hardest thing would be not working with those guys. So I now coach alongside Mel as well, which is amazing. You know, I'm with her probably five or six times a week. And that's amazing because I managed to keep that passion for, you know, really high end fast swimming. And also get to keep those people in my life who have been my family for the last, you know, five, 10 years. And as I mentioned in this video, you know, few members of my family have been so important into my journey. And as I mentioned in this video, there's a few members of my family who've been so important in this journey in terms of supporting me and making sure I can still swim no matter what goes on, whether it's a cut from funding or, or really not being happy in swimming. I guess I should kind of give some thoughts about, you know, post-swimming and how I feel after retirement. Um, still deciding if I can call it retirement. I think the question I get asked the most is, do I have any regret? And in terms of big regrets, I don't have any in swimming. There's, there's no regrets I have in terms of, you know, any big decisions or big things that happened, you know. I wouldn't change any of the bad swims. I probably wouldn't change any of the good swims. I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. It's really cliche, but I do believe that. I'm sure there's little things along the way. You know, I probably wouldn't have said one comment to someone and, you know, is it regret? Don't really know, but you know, there's no big decisions that I regret or anything big about my swimming career that I wish hadn't happened or had happened in a different way. Another thing I'm asked a lot is would I ever go back to swimming? And no, a hundred percent no. There's times I think about it, but no, not seriously. I don't ever consider going back. A lot of people ask me whether I think I reached my potential as well, which I don't think I ever did. I think I was a long way off what I could have achieved. Now looking back on it as a as a 23 year old compared to a 17, 18 year old who's very hungry and very aggressive towards their career, I think. Swimming's moving forward so fast that I think it would be very optimistic to think I could ever win a medal at, say, an Olympic Games or anything like that. But I definitely don't think I was anywhere near my potential. You know, I went 212 
for a 200 breast long course when I was 18. I think we're seeing that swimmers are kind of getting older in some events. You know, you're seeing swimmers pop out a little bit later, you know, 25, 26 is when swimmers are starting to, you know, make a really good transition into seniors. So I do believe I could have gone a lot quicker than I did. I don't believe I would have ever been a world record holder or anything like that, but I do believe I had more to give. For me, to be honest, it just wasn't worth it. You know, if you're not making a living from doing it, you know, it's very hard to justify it. And you know, you can you can dedicate your life till you're 24, 25, and you could break your ankle. I just don't think that that's worth the risk of, you know, spending, you know, this this prime time in my life where I've got so many great ideas and I'm so passionate about what I do. I don't I don't want to, to try and really achieve in swimming. I feel like I've really started to make a dent into how we can improve young swimmers' journeys and how we can make swimmers, coaches, and, and parents' journeys better through sport. And the work that we're doing with Adam, you know, some of the projects we're launching are so exciting and that excites me so much more than, than thinking about swimming. And I even watch swimming competitions now and I love watching it, but there's no part of me that thinks I'd love to be there. It excites me so much more thinking about the projects that we're doing and the stuff we're gonna launch next year or five years or whatever it is. That excites me so much more than my personal swimming. And that doesn't change my passion for the sport and it doesn't change the fact I love working with young athletes or helping people have a better journey. It just means my passion for me personally swimming isn't there anymore. I know a lot of people talk about when they retire from swimming or a sport and how they can feel like they don't really have a purpose. And I did have massive struggles when I finished swimming. There was things that I found really difficult and there was months and months where I really, really struggled with pretty much everything I was doing. It probably didn't help that we we're in national lockdown, but I was just really not very happy for a long, long time. And you know, whether that's leaving sport or whatever it was and, and having that void where sport would usually have filled or sport would usually have been the, the therapy, I guess. And not having that thing where I could go to the pool and feel like that person that's swimming that was there supporting me was was pretty hard. So I know this has been a massive video. I think this will be like 20, 30 minutes, probably. Um, I've tried to cut it down as short as I can, but I'm sure it's still gonna be really long. But I just thought it'd be better to kind of just get everything out that was in my swimming journey. You know, there's there's many different things. I'm sure I'll reference them in videos to come, but I feel like these were a lot of the key moments that were in my swimming journey. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Sorry, it took so long to put together. It's just been very, very busy. And yeah, I'm sure no one's actually watched this part because it's so long that you must be absolutely bored out of your heads. But if you did, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.